the idea is to uh, film this first part before starting the MATLAB stuff and put it to YouTube. You will not be visible. It's a long lens. Uh, if you feel uneasy about it, let me know. But uh, you, you wouldn't appear there. And probably the discussion, if we have it, I have the mic here, so I, I'll probably repeat the question and, and answer. <coughs> so that it's OK, but let's go with this, if it's OK. I was pleasantly surprised <laughs> about this email out of nowhere, <laughs> telling that they follow the course in India. OK, so welcome to the Inverse Problems Lecture. Also, welcome all YouTube watchers. Uh, so let's quickly go through, again, the basic situation we consider in the course. So uh, we have the we have a measurement vector in RK coming from some device we have. Maybe a camera or x-ray tomography device or whatever. I mean, there are plenty of examples of, of machines producing digital data to us. Our smartphones have many, many measurement sensors in them. So some device gives us uh, a vector. And we are interested in situations where this measurement is actually only indirect information about something we are interested in. So there is some kind of a measurement process uh, and some object if beautiful, we are interested in. And this is also, the measurement is also corrupted by some, some noise, some errors, usually random errors. This here I call the continuum model. With the idea that, uh, well, this here comes from some kind of physical process we cannot ever analyze in, in all detail. This is something usually we use mathematical physics, like partial differential equations or some integrals or any mathematical tools we have uh, to model this measurement process as closely as possible. And then, because here still the idea is that this if beautiful is a function defined on Rn, or maybe an interval or subset of Rn. So it's kind of a continuum object. It's not discrete. It's kind of an infinite dimensional thing, this f. And a is an operator. In this course, we only deal with linear operators. But of course, in practice, there are many important measurements where this operator is nonlinear, like electrical impedance tomography, for example, or inverse scattering processes. Anyway. Here, this is a linear operator, but acting on some functions defined on Euclidean space. So for computers, we need something finite. For that reason, we will build, we will build a computational model. This is called computational model. Which is fully discrete. So here, uh, f is in R n, uh, m is in R k, and a is a k by n matrix. So this is something we build ourselves. And we try to make it so that this vector f is some kind of finite approximation uh, to this guy. Maybe this is a set of point values of the function f. Maybe f is a, a, a vector of coefficients in some basis, like Fourier basis or wavelet basis. The A matrix needs to be built in a way that whatever A is doing to the vector f, the result will be close to this m tilde. So it's, if f is approximating f beautiful, then the vector AF needs to be close to the vector a beautiful, f beautiful. That's somehow the setup in our inverse problem we are looking at. And we have two examples we are looking at. The one dimensional convolution here being a convolution integral uh, over the real line. 
well, we restrict it to the interval to 0 to 1, but anyway. Uh, and for that, we built some uh, convolution matrices. And now, two-dimensional tomography, where in this situation, we have an area, let's say, in, in 2D, in, well, we, we consider 2D tomography uh, in the course. So we have uh, a square in the plane, and inside the square we have some area inside which we have uh, a function fx, non-negative function, and these k numbers are actually line integrals line integrals of the function f over some collection of lines. And the computational model we will build in a way that we divide the square into pixels. <coughs> we consider functions that are constant inside each pixel and we number them so the elements of f are the constant pixel values in the pixels, and we have the same set of measurements going on there. Well, uh, they should be the same green lines. So let's, today, let's take a look at this situation here. Let's build our own little uh, phantom consisting of a few squares, and then uh, look at this matrix. Square. Yes. The, the this thing. Yes. Uh, inside of the f x goes to zero. Here we think yeah in this area, in this area we think f is zero, and inside this curve, f is a function of x. Uh, but it, it says there f x and then some. Oh, it's greater or equal. Uh, greater or equal. Oh, that makes sense. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, yeah, it means that x-rays can only get weaker inside uh, the medium. They will not get stronger. Yeah, no, it's greater or equal to zero. <coughs> Unless if there is something radioactive inside, then it's different. But let's assume there is nothing radioactive inside. Okay, so last time we already built uh, a matrix A like this, but let's revisit that case and make a little uh, singular value decomposition analysis of the matrices. And also, let me point out here that uh, in the real inverse problem, our data comes from uh, a natural process. It's a vector. And in the computational model, this is only an approximation. Uh, it can be that this model will never really produce exactly the same M tilde that was measured. And therefore, there is a concept called inverse crime, which means that when we are computationally studying inverse problems, uh, it's often a good idea to build this model and study it a little bit. And then one could kind of choose some f, uh, multiply it by matrix A to get some measurement, simulated measurement, and then try some inversion method to get from M to F. When the same matrix A is used both for simulation of data and, and the inversion, sometimes we get unrealistically good results. That's the so-called inverse crime. To avoid inverse crime, the data should come from an actual measurement process or from a different model, maybe a more precise model giving us M tilde. And then we should try an inversion method making use of matrix A, but the data should come from somewhere else than this one. But today, in this lecture, we will be committing inverse crimes. So we will just work with this one. We will produce the data with the same process and just see what's going on. But just to warn you, today is not the real deal. Today we are committing some inverse crimes. Yes? There's going to be like in period four that we actually measure, some, measure something. I think we will measure. Uh, at least for the deconvolution case, we will measure already in this, uh, in this uh, within a couple of weeks, I think. X-ray measurements may go to period four. We'll see. 
how this goes on. Okay, and then let's let's recall a little bit uh, what kind of matrices we are dealing with. So. In this kind of very simple case with only nine pixels, and these are the constant values given, and assuming that the length of the side of the pixel is one, then this x-ray is just computing one times four plus one times four plus one times five. The result is, uh, after some calibration of the data, we can get such numbers. Then we move our device and take different x-rays, uh, now we get column sums and then we can do this diagonally and then we get uh, the lengths of parts inside pixels. This is a quite ideal situation, the rays going exactly from corner to corner, so therefore the length of the diagonal. And such a matrix, so this is the direct problem given this one, what are the numbers? But the interesting problem is if we know the numbers from the measurement, what should we fill in here? It's like a Sudoku problem. Uh, so how to build uh, the computational model in this case? First of all, we need to give names to these unknown values, so they will make up uh, the vector f. The sums we just saw along these lines, let's collect them uh, in, in the m vector. Then, then we, we want to build this kind of M equals AF model. And the matrix A in this case looks like this. And here let's just see for example for M1. M1 x-ray is traveling inside pixels 2 and 6. And the length in each of them is square root of 2. So uh, M1 is here, so the first row of the matrix A concerns M1, and there we have the square root of 2 in positions 2 and 6, hitting F2 and F6, coming from the geometry here. This is how the matrix uh, is built. Of course, we are interested in more complicated cases uh, like this. So here, uh, we take several rays in many directions and we collect the result in a so-called sinogram like that. To have a more meaningful problem we need uh, a higher dimension both in the unknown and in the data. So we will build today this kind of model where we go around like this using MATLAB's Radon function collecting a sinogram like this and it will make up the M measurement vector by just uh, going first first column, then second column, third column. So try, drop it as, as a long vertical uh, vector. That will be the vector M. And F here, this pixel image will be F as we saw before. Yes? I have a question about it because you, in the previous example, you chose pixel length to be one. Yep. Uh, in here, is pixel length again one or are you taking bigger blocks? So is the pixel length here one? Yes, we will use uh, MATLAB's Radon function and it will take the pixel side length one. However, this is an excellent question because uh, when we will build uh, our... W w a bit later we want to avoid 